Okay, thank you everyone for coming along to this first after lunch session at PyCon 2014 here in Montreal. Uh, we've got three really excellent speeches uh, all lined up for you. Our first presenter is a programmer and data scientist based here in Montreal. Uh, she works on Stripe's data team and is the co-organizer of PyLadies Montreal and the Montreal All-Girl Hack Night. Uh, to speak to us today about diving into open data with IPython Notebook and Pandas, please welcome Julia Evans. All right, um, so today what I want to talk to you about, um, I work on a data team, um, which means I work with data, um, and I, I have a, a bunch of different tools that I use, right? Um, sometimes I use Hadoop, um, sometimes I use Python, sometimes like I use R once, um, <laughs> and my favorite tools to use, like the things that I enjoy using the most are Python tools. I enjoy using IPython Notebook and Pandas together to answer questions about my data. And what I want to explain in this talk is why they're my favorite um, and why they could maybe be your favorite if you don't use them already. So um, the way this talk is structured, um, it's kind of small, not going to get better apparently, um, is step one, what are IPython notebook and pandas? Like what do those words mean? Um, you may know a little bit already if you watch Renana Perez's excellent keynote this morning. Um, most of my time is going to be spent on practical examples of how to use these to answer questions about your data. And then I'll end with like a little bit of advice about like where to go next if you want to learn more. So the first question is like, what are IPython notebook and pandas and like NumPy? Um, and like how do these this, this like scientific com computing tools work together? Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is IPython notebook. Um, so IPython Notebook is like a web-based user interface for Python. And you may think, like, why would I want that, right? Like, you can already write Python, maybe. Um, and why would you want it to be on the internet, right? Like, why would you want it to be in a web page? So um, the way IPython Notebook works um, is it runs as a server on your machine. Um, and then you will open a new, new notebook, right? And I'm going to give you a really short demo instead of listing a bunch of features. So. Um, the most important thing that isn't always obvious is when you use IPython Notebook, you can run, like, write any Python code that you would normally write. Like, it's not like a limited environment where there are only certain things you can do. Um, it's just Python. Like, you can do any Python things that you would otherwise do. Like, you could connect to databases, and you can, like, you can do everything, right? Um, so one thing that I really like about it is, like, let's say I import something, and then I do, like, string.split, and I want to know how it works, right? Normally, you would look up the documentation. Here, it sees that I've hesitated. And it's like, would you like some documentation? <laughs> and then I press tab again. And it's like, oh, would you like even more? And then I press tab again, because I'm kind of frustrated. And it pops up all of the documentation at the bottom, explaining how split works for me. And I can like resize it. And I didn't have to leave, right? And I didn't have to even know. It just like came up for me. Um, so I find it a really useful interactive tool for doing like exploratory work. Like I could do like string dot split, right? Like this, um, two three, and then I can be like, oh, that wasn't what I wanted. Maybe I need to tell it to split on a comma. Oh, I see. Right. So my workflow around this is often I'll do something, do it wrong as we do, um, and then change it, and I can iterate really quickly. So that's it Python notebook. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is pandas. Um, so often I will do some kind of data analysis, like I'll have a data set with every complaint call ever made in New York, right, um, for fun. And then I want to know, like, let's say I want to know like every hour how many noise complaints were made, um, except like I would like to split it out by borough, um, and also maybe like I only care about the period between like September and December. Um, so I want to do like a lot of filtering and aggregating. And you might think that you might have to write a loop, like if you're writing a program. That would be like something that could happen. Um, and with pandas, you don't have to write loops. <laughs> um, and also, like doing something like aggregate all the noise complaints and filter out the things you don't want, and then graph it, except like, um, and then graph the number each hour is like five lines of code. Like, so it's really compact. It's really easy. Um, and but it's not like always super obvious how to get started. So that's what I'm going to explain. Um, but pandas is kind of the tool that lets you do all this filtering um, and parsing. So pandas is built on top of NumPy, 
what is NumPy? If you went to Brandon Rose's talk yesterday about Python data structures, you will know that if you have a, a Python list with like 5 million things, if you iterate through that list, you have to make 5 million objects, which takes time, even though computers are fast. So I, but like saying like NumPy is faster is kind of um, like, it's, it's not, it's not uh, specific enough, right? So I wanted to do an example. And my example was like, I'll take a whole bunch of numbers, right? And then find the sum of the squares. So I did it in Python, right? I wrote a like, pretty, simple, pretty simple example. It took 1.2 seconds um, to add up all the, those numbers squared, which is pretty good, right? Like computers are fast. That, that was a big number. Um, but if I do it in NumPy, it takes like 83 milliseconds, which is like, like 15 times faster. Um, so when I say NumPy is faster, I mean NumPy is like 15 times faster. Like that's what you should be thinking about, or more, right? Um, so, and the, the reason it's faster is because it implements all the operations, like it stores your um, data structures as like C arrays, um, so, and then like when you operate on NumPy arrays, you do it all at once. So instead of being like writing a for loop, you'll be like, just sum all these things, right? And you just like call NumPy functions, and NumPy takes care of everything for you. Um, and sim so pandas is built on top of NumPy, and you'll have pandas functions which are built on top of NumPy functions. So, um, I use pandas inside IPython notebook, and NumPy makes pandas fast. Okay, um, quick note, how to install these tools. Don't use the like, Ubuntu packages, install things using pip, um, or there's a, tool called, there's a distribution called Anaconda, which I find super easy to use, and I use a lot. Um, but yeah, never use packages. Like, these, these things are evolving super fast. The IPython community is doing amazing work. Um, and you should use the latest versions um, because they're amazing. So, um, and you can run IPython Notebook by typing IPython Notebook. It's good. <laughs> Not super hard. Um, and then when you run IPython Notebook, you get this. Like, it'll pop up something in your browser. And then you can get started. So, now I want to talk about some practical examples, as I promised. Um, so, the first thing. I want to talk about is the data set we're going to be using. We're in Montreal. People, it, it's a bit cold right now. It was much colder a few weeks ago. Even when it's very cold, people go biking, right? Um, so we have bike paths here. Um, there are sensors on these bike paths, which me me measure the number of cyclists who are going past that sensor every day. Um, and that data is published online, so we can play with it and find out things about when people go biking. For example, do people go biking when it's minus 20? No. <laughs> Except people do, actually, which is what well, you know, we're going to get there. Um, so this is the data set we're going to be talking about. So I downloaded it. Um, this is not big data, right? This is like one data point for each day of the year. Um, so um, I downloaded this CSV. And this is what it looked like when I started, right? Um, if you've parsed CSVs before, you may be familiar with things that can go wrong. Um, so what, what this is, is it's one row for each day of the year. Um, it has the date and the number of cyclists on each, um, on each bike path. And th there are some names that are in bike paths. So you'll notice there are encoding problems, the separator, it thought it was a comma and it wasn't a comma, right? And you may not be impressed with pandas right now. Um, so the reason you should be impressed is you can also, there's a lot of text here, but um, I gave it a whole bunch of options. And I was like, read the CSV, but the encoding is Latin 1, and the separator is a semicolon, and you should index by date, and you should parse the dates, and you should parse the date first because we're not American. Um, and we <laughs> write dates like Canadians. Um, and it has all these, op these options, and there are more options if you have an even weirder CSV. And like, the, like, the people who wrote Pandas have thought about this, right? And they know that maybe there are like 12 lines at the top of your CSV which are irrelevant to your CSV. So there is a skip option where you can skip the first 20 rows because that happened when I was downloading weather data from weather.gc.ca and then it was there. Um, and I didn't need to write code because it was just like an option to this read CSV method. Um, and there's also like read Excel. Um, I had a client. At, at some point where they like send us a whole bunch of Excel files and it was fine because pandas can read Excel. Uh, <laughs> it's great. Um, so, so the first thing I do, um, so now you'll notice that this is beautiful, right? Um, I would like to stop for a minute and talk about what we're looking at, right? Like I said, bike data is this variable. What is it? Um, so bike data is a data frame. Who's used R before? A few of you. Um, a data frame in Pandas is based on a data frame in R. Your intuitions are correct. Um, who here has used SQL? 
more of you. Um, a data frame is a little bit like a database table, right? There are rows, there are columns. Um, there's an index, which is a little bit like your primary key. Um, so here, the data is the index. And um, the way this is stored, like the way kind of like Pandas thinks about this, is it's a bunch of NumPy arrays, which are the, ro which are the columns. Um, so it's stored as a bunch of columns, but it's displayed to you as like a table altogether, like an Excel spreadsheet kind of, except awesome. Um, <laughs> because it's not an Excel spreadsheet, and it's much easier to use um, as a programmer. So, um, so we have our data frame. Um, the first operation I want to show you is you can take the first three rows. You can take like a row slice. Um, um, so that's great. Um, and let's say we wanted to plot it. You might think that you have to learn how to use matplotlib and learn how to use a plotting library. That's not true. You just do dot plot. <laughs> um, and then we see, like we look at this, um, and we're like, okay. Um, in the winter, until March, it's really cold outside, and no one really goes biking. And then in the summer, people are like, it's summer. This is the best. Everything is amazing. Everyone is happy. Um, so this is not a huge surprise, right? Um, so the way if I should explain this graph for a minute. Um, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is like the number of people biking on each day. And then the, the different lines are different bike paths. Um, so like Barry, the blue one, is right near my house, and it's a really popular bike path. You can go really fast. There's a super steep hill, um, and it's really fun and like a little bit dangerous. Um, it's very popular. <laughs> um, so let's say like I said that Barry was the most popular, right? Um, but if I wanted to like quantify that, and I was sending a report to like my boss in charge of bike paths, right? I would like to. And I would like to like, give them the median, right? Um, the way you do that is you're like a dot median. <laughs> um, and there are a lot of these like, super helpful func like, methods that Pandas gives you on data frames um, for like, finding out statistics about your data. Um, so, and let's say I then wanted to plot the medians and have like a bar chart, because everyone loves bar charts. Then I could be like bike data dot median dot plot. <laughs> um, and then it gave me some weird error. Pretend that error isn't there. <laughs> that was some kind of font thing. Um, and then you can see that, that like, Barry is the biggest, right? And then I can be like, this is the best bike path. We should kill all the others. I don't know. Like, whatever try, kind of conclusion you're trying to convince the people in your board with your board meeting, you can show them this graph. OK. Um, a few other things I want to talk about. Um, you can take a column slice. So like, let's say sometimes I have like, CSVs which have like, 2 billion rows, or like 50, um, and I only really care about three. Um, you can give uh, it a, a list of rows as, as an index and just restrict your attention to that. Um, and then you can also like, say you to take the first three rows. And you can switch those around. You can be like, give me the first three rows and then only these columns. It doesn't care what order you do it in. Pandas is nice to you. OK. Um, the last kind of like basic pan like NumPy Pandas feature I want you to, t to talk about um, is my favorite, one of my favorites. I have many favorites, sorry. Um, so. Um, I talked about doing operations all at once, right? So let's say I wanted to find all of the days where there are less than 75 people biking on the Barry bike path near my house, right? Because like 75 isn't a lot. Um, it's a pretty popular bike path. Um, so what I can do is I can say, when is this less than 75? And it gives me this long vector of trues and falses, right? And then what I can do with that is I can put that into, like I can index with it, and it will give me all of the rows that satisfy that condition. And I can combine conditions. And I can use arbitrarily complicated conditions. So it's like a SQL query if you've used that, except you can write Python code, right? Um, and you can't just like, do whatever SQL might allow you to do. You can do anything you want and do kind of like arbitrary queries. Um, and we can see here that like, the days with less than 70 people are all days in, in January and February, because January and February are so cold, right? <laughs> it's like, not a huge surprise. So um, that's super powerful, and I use it all the time. OK, so the next question I had um, is I wanted to know like, what all of this variation was about. right? Like, there's this graph, and it's like number of cyclists. And I wanted to know, like, is this because of weekends? Like, is the variation because more people bike on weekdays or on weekends? So here's, here's a question. Like, who thinks that in Montreal, we're a city of commuter cyclists, and we mostly bike because we're going to work? Some people, who thinks it's, we're, we bike for fun? 
there's disagreement. We can solve this with data. This is the best. We're going to find out who's right. So the first thing I'm going to do um, is I have a data frame, and I'm going to add a new column. The way you add a new column is like adding a new key to a dictionary, um, because everything is nice. Um, and like these interfaces work kind of like you might expect. Um, so um, Pandas is really good with time series. A time series is a fancy word for um, a bunch of numbers which are indexed by like a date. So like stocks, right? Um, it was originally built by, by people who were doing like financial data analysis, um, like Wes McKinney. Um, so I had a weekday column, and I'm like, index.weekday. And then it gives me a number, right, for each uh, day of the year. And then what I want to do with this is I want to um, collect all of, the, all of the entries with like, the same weekday. So like, say like, everything with weekday 6, I would like to add all those up. And then everything with weekday 0, I would like to add all those up. And then every day with weekday 1, I'll add all those up. And then we'll figure out wh what 6 and 0 actually means. Um, and then we'll draw a pretty graph and show it to our board meeting, right? <laughs> so um, once I do that, um, if you've done, who's used like a SQL group by? This is like that. Um, if you haven't used a SQL group by, it's what I said, right? Um, you have like all of the zeros and you add them up. <laughs> um, but like you should think of a pandas group by like a SQL group by. That's why it's called that. <laughs> Um, so we say group by weekday, and then aggregate all of those groups by taking the sum. You can use any function you want here. You don't just have to use built-in functions. You can write your own functions. You can use any function that you find in the wild. You can use someone else's, you know, you can, you can just use any function. Um, so I do this, and then I get a new data frame, which has all of the weekdays as the index. And then for each column, it's added them all up. And it did all the work for me. And I didn't have to write a loop because loops are work, and we don't like doing work. We like other people to do our work for us, or at least I do. Um, right. Um, but like numbers, like who likes reading tables of a lot of numbers? Some of you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I feel you. I like numbers. However, I prefer graphs, right? Um, so what I did was I changed my index by hand. I just looked up. like I found a date that was zero, and then I looked up in my calendar. <laughs> to find out what day of the week it was, and I found out that it was Monday um, because I, I wanted to do it fast. Um, if you were like doing it the right way, you would probably find out some way to do it programmatically. I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> so I, I changed the index to be right, and it turns out that Thursday is the most popular day. The days of the week are more popular than the weekends, and it looks like we're commuters. It looks like we bike to work. <laughs> Um, so that's cool. Um, and then I, I, I drew a bar graph. You'll note that like, if you want to plot a bar graph, you're like, plot kind equals bar. Um, that's like one of the main kinds of graphs I draw a lot. Um, so that, that's good, right? And you'll notice that we didn't have to write loops to do that, right? Like, that was just like a few lines of code. All right. So, but if we look at, the, at, this, at this chart again, like, there was a little bit of variation by day of the week. But that's definitely not like all that's causing this like huge spike throughout the year, right? Um, so I'd like to do like a better investigation into this because um, we're like data scientists or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> so the next thing I wanted to do is look at the temperature, right? Like it's cold. It don't need to be like amazing uh, data statistics magic people to like know that people don't like going biking when it's cold. Um, so I wrote this function. Don't look at this function. It's kind of big. Um, but basically what I was doing was like I went to climate.weather.gc.ca and like I found some like place where I could put in things into the URL and it would give me a CSV kind of and I could put it together. Anyway, it wasn't a lot of work is kind of what I'm trying to say here. Like you can imagine you could have written this. Um, and then I got my weather data and I looked at it. And it gave me the temperature every hour. And I was like, that's good. Um, the main problem with this is I didn't want the temperature every hour. I wanted the temperature every day, right? Because we only have the bike data every day. Um, so I decided to take the average temperature. Um, and the way you take the average temperature is you resample. 
um, which is apparently something people do when analyzing like financial stock data, because they're like, I have my stock prices every like two milliseconds, and I only need them every like ten milliseconds. I don't know <laughs> about high frequency stock analysis too much, um, but when I did it, I resampled. So. Um, so we resample. Um, resampling is great. You do dot resample, and then you give it the time period you want. You can write it in like you write d. If you want two days, you write two d. If you want three hours, you write three h. It's pretty simple. Um, and then you say how, and you can either say something like mean, or you can give it a function, because um, you can all basically like always give pandas things functions. Um, so once I've done that, I get the, the average temperature every day, right? And we could argue for like hours about whether or not this is a useful thing, like this is like the best way to resample, um, but we won't. <laughs> you can download this afterwards and do a better job than me. That is what I would like. So um, we can see like on January 3rd, it was like minus 14 Celsius, which is pretty cold. I think it's like zero Fahrenheit um, if you're American. Um, so I drew, I drew a little graph of like bikes per day and temperature. And you'll see like this. I'm going to go over there really quickly um, because this was really exciting to me. Um, oh, no, but I'm not tall enough. OK, this spike here, this was in March. And it went up to 18 degrees. And it was beautiful. And I missed it. And all of my friends were like, oh, it was so nice. And I was outside. And I was wearing a tank top. And it was March. And I was like, why did I miss it? Um, anyway, this was like kind of unheard of. But like the temperature went up super high, and everyone went out biking, and everyone was so excited. And then it went down again, and everyone was like, "Never mind," and they put their bike away again, right? Like, um, so you can see that like there, there's like a real correlation here, right? But the rest of it, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm not like as sold on like the other spikes in this graph. Just kind of that one in March over there. Um, but that's cool. We've done science, <laughs> in, by which I mean looking at graphs and points. I'm not a real scientist. So, um, right. So now the next question was like, there's more variation here, right? Like, so maybe let's look at whether it's raining. Let's look at some precipitation. So, I wanted to know like what percentage of each day was it raining, right? And here you might again think, and we if we look at our original um, data weather data frame here, it doesn't give us like a raininess quotient. It says like a string, which is the weather, right? Um, so you might think you would have to do work here, and you'd be wrong, <laughs> because pandas knows everything. <laughs> so pandas has all these magical string functions. So what you say is like, look at the weather, and then go to like the bunch of string functions and say like, does this contain rain? And then it gives you a one or a zero, depending on whether or not it contains a string rain, and it just does everything for you. Um, so. And then you resample that again every day. Um, so we get like the percentage of hours of the day w when it was raining, right? And like whether or not that's the right thing, I don't know, right? Maybe. Um, and then we get this other graph. And like this graph is a lot less clear to me. Um, there are some spikes over here where like, like this one. And over here, like maybe that correlates with like a spike downwards. I can kind of see it. Like, like 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 this and this. but like also like pointing at uh, spikes in graphs is like a really dangerous thing to do in analyzing data. This is not a good practice, and because you like you can just like overfit with your brain a lot because we're really good at detecting patterns that aren't there. Um, so it would be better to look at like a correlation, um, which you could also do, but we're not going to do um, because this is all I have to say. But don't applaud yet. I have more to say. But this is all I have to say about our practical example, right? Um, this wasn't a lot of code, is the main point I want to make, right? Um, except for the weather thing, which was like a disaster. But like, pretend that didn't happen. Um, and there were no loops, right? Like, we made these graphs, and like, we found out if it contained rain, and then we like resampled, and we did all this kind kind of cool stuff. And we didn't have to write loops. We had to write like up to like six lines of code, right? Including reading in the data. It was super easy, um, and it's very easy to experiment. So I have a little bit of advice for you um, if you want to be using these tools. Um, I find it super useful to read some of the documentation. Um, there's a ton of documentation. Um, 
And what I often find is I'll read like a tutorial and I'll learn a little bit, and then I'll go look at the documentation. I'll find something which like totally helps me, and I'm like, I wish I knew about that like six months ago. Um, so it's good to go look at a little bit from time to time and brush up um, once you've learned some of the basics. Um, there's like this huge PDF and really good API documentation, and I really enjoy it. Um, Wes McKinney wrote a book called Python for Data Analysis, which I enjoy and has a lot of really great examples. Um, one of the main, most important things is like always try to use like these built-in operations, right? Like dot resample or like um, things that have been built, things that are built in. Um, because writing your own loops is a lot of like it's more of your work. Um, it means that they'll be really slow. It'll be like 20 times slower um, as we saw before, right? Um, and it's like it doesn't matter if it's taking a second, but if you're doing like real big computations, it's a big problem. Um, and though you can, if you really need to do some custom computation, you can use tools like Cython um, to, to, to like write things that are compiled to C and actually run quickly. And that's pretty approachable. Like I've done it before. I kind of like Googled some examples and dived into the Pandasaurus code and pulled something out and copied it and messed with it, and it worked. Um, it's, it's like pretty approachable to do that. Um, but it's easier to avoid doing that and just use built-in functions whenever possible. Um, and often more things are built in than you think. Um, one thing that I did is I made a pandas cookbook if you want to get started. Um, so I have this GitHub repository, and there's like 10 chapters, which are like different like small examples of things that you, you can do with pandas together with like practical examples. So there's this day's data set. There's some other data sets that I use to kind of show off some pandas' cap capabilities. Um, and so if you want to take a look at that, you could contribute to it also. Um, there are examples of how, like, how to use it with like SQL databases. Um, and that might be a place to get started. And um, that's it. Thanks, Julia. That was fantastic. Um, so if there are any questions for Julia, uh, come and line up at this microphone that we've cleverly placed here at the front of the room. Uh, we'll just give a few moments for our queue to form. Great. First question. Thank you. It seems like going from uh, fundamentally loop-based programming to this sort of vector-based model um, require a, a fairly different set of thinking. Mm -hmm. So is there any particular tips for people who are not as familiar with operating on vectors that, that you found were helpful in getting started? That's a really good question. I guess I think of them as a little bit like database queries. Um, so if you, if you used to think about database queries, that's like all a very like group-based way of thinking of things. Um, and if you're not, I find that like the more I practice it, the better it gets. That's like a, not a very good answer. <laughs> Hi. Uh, where does something like scikit-learn uh, fit into this? The slides? Uh, the, oh, sorry. No, the um, scikit-learn, another? Thing oh. I've heard some talks about this weekend. Oh, yeah, I talked about scikit-learn in my abstract. Yeah. Um, so, like, n NumPy integrates really, really well scikit-learn. So, anytime you want to use, like, if you want to do machine learning on your pandas data frames, that'll just work. Um, so, panda would be for, like, data analysis and for scikit-learn would be for modeling? And yeah, scikit-learn for modeling. Yeah. Right. So, if you want to make a map model, you can, like, send, like, a pandas data frame as input, and that, that'll, that'll work seamlessly. Right, um, and that's something that I do. Yeah. <coughs> Um, so first off, this looks like a lot of fun because my city's been releasing a lot of open data lately. Um, but can this, can this do geographical stuff? Graphical stuff? Or geographical. Geographical stuff. That's a good question. I don't think that Pandas does geographical stuff by itself. I don't know if that's true. Not that I know of. Um, but there are really good tools that I've seen. Um, okay. Yeah. I can, I can show you something later. Okay. Julia, appreciate the talk. Um, quick question on customizing IPython notebooks. I, I've seen a lot of different customizations of the interface for IPython notebooks mm. on the web. I was wondering if you had any, any if you customize IPython notebook at all, and if so, do you have any recommended resources? So do you mean like customizing people's slides? No, customizing um, the actual interfaces. I know that you can kind of, as I understand it, you can um, uh, customize it so that certain commands do certain different things in IPython notebook. OK. You, like some people do like interactive JavaScript things in IPython notebook. I, I just or think no. there's a lot of different options um, in oh. terms of customers. So customers. the answer is I don't know. OK. I think the answer is I don't know, but I would love to see. Well, yeah. I'll let you know. I don't do that. <laughs> hey, Julia. 
how do you make sure that the conclusions you make are real and not just like because of this data? The, I think the answer to that is like learn statistics <laughs> do you have any, like, and acquire friends who know statistics. Um, yeah. Um, I don't want to say too much about this because I feel like I'll embarrass myself. But um, one thing you can do is be really careful about what data you look at. So like, so for example, you don't want to like look at data and then like take out points that you think are interesting, like I was doing. Right? Like what I was doing was a terrible thing to do. Right? You shouldn't do that. Um, what you can do is like think about the questions that you're asking carefully before you look at the data. Um, and I think that's a good way. Yeah, like like asking the question after you look at the data is a bad choice because then like you've like made up a question, right? Um, but if you ask the question before you look at the data, then you have a, bit, a better chance of like doing a good job. Uh, I think we've all enjoyed um, hearing your experience and enthusiasm for this uh, for this topic. Uh, everybody, please thank Julia Evans for a talk. Uh, so we've got a